So I, I want to start today with a question that I think is the most important question we can possibly ask to differentiate our projects or our overall platforms and brands. It's a question that if we understand it enough and apply it consistently enough, the answer to it, I think can help us differentiate with substance and not have to resort to hollow gimmicks or hype and the stuff that maybe we dislike that we see spinning on the internet. So it's a really transformative question. That question is, what's the best Disney film of all time? It's going to get weirder before it gets better. So please stay with me for a moment, people, if you can. I actually want you to answer this in the chat. What is your answer to this question? Please place it in the chat now. What is the best Disney film of all time? Um, Jeff, we were talking before we started that you have two four-year-old boys. You have twins. What is the answer in your household for the best Disney film of all time? I, I think it's a new one. Uh, it's a movie called Luca, which is about a, a yes. little Italian boy who uh, becomes a sea monster. Yep. I love Luca. <laughs> I, uh, ba I got Bambi, The Lion King. Max said Aladdin. Shane said my daughter would say Lion King all the way. Hector says Coco. Uh, I, I love these answers. Um, and I really appreciate the participation. I do. But unfortunately, you're all wrong. There is an objective, correct, right answer to this question, which is a goofy movie. <laughs> if you know you know it's because of powerline the pop star in the film like legit good music i'm still waiting on the album it's a goofy movie that is the correct answer now this is a ridiculous and quite silly question to be asking what's the best disney film of all time because we can't answer it in any objective or academic sense like there would be unanimity in the chat if that was the case but we spend so much time in our work, whether we sell products or services, build a personal brand or a corporate brand, trying to convey to others that we're the objective right pick. We're the number one in the category. That's the way we go about it, most of our marketing today, which is silly because that is not how people make choices. We are not rational creatures. We're subjective first, and then we rationalize what we did later. We make emotional choices. And typically we are not playing to those emotions to get picked. We want them to pick us. We want them to stick with us against incredible odds. And so we're trying to project that we're the best. But something really telling for our business growth actually happened when I asked you this question. I think it's actually very hopeful. I asked you, what's the best Disney film of all time? But you didn't answer it. The way you interpreted this question was different. You said, what's my favorite Disney film of all time? There is nothing objective or academically correct or universal about that. But that's how you answered. And most of the things we do in most of the places we go in work and in life are predicated not on the best pick, the objective top of the heap, but our favorite, our personal preferred picks for a specific purpose. And that's great news because we are competing for the attention of our buyers, not just in our competitive set, but for the 24 hours also being competed for among the best storytellers, entrepreneurs, authors, politicians, podcasters, YouTubers, you name it. Not to mention all the people who aren't creating content, but are still commanding the time of our buyers in their lives. But to compete in that world, you don't have to be the biggest or the best. This is not a resources problem. You need to be their favorite. This is an emotions problem. Be their personal preferred pick for a specific purpose. Really think about the favorite things that you enroll into your life and keep there. Your favorite sport or team, your favorite restaurant or food, clothing or drink, city or animal. It's like these are parts of our identity. So when I say that's my favorite podcast or that's my favorite city, I'm really telling you more about myself than those things. It's like self-expressing to say something is my favorite. And there's nothing objective about this. My favorite shirt is not objectively the best made shirt that either exists or even that I own, but it feels irreplaceable to me. And imagine if we felt that way to our audiences too, irreplaceable. My favorite sports team, the New York Knicks. And if you know anything about sports, you know that for literal decades of my life. Oh, Jeff, you're killing me. Are you serious? All the way in San Diego, wearing the enemy's hat with the Red Sox logo. This isn't my Yankees mug, but I do have one. I figured I'd have an opportunity to troll you. Ah, oh, way to troll me. I'm never giving a talk for you guys. Oh, anyways, the Knicks, objectively, if you know about sports for decades of my life, among the worst picks, terrible franchise, not winning anything, making awful decisions left and right. Yet they were my pick. Does that sound like rational thinking to you? No, but it is human thinking. And guess what your audience is full of? When your audience makes choices, 
they play favorites. So the actual question we have to ask is, well, are you one of them? Don't be the best, be their favorite. Now, most of the marketing we do, most of the way we build our businesses actively undermines this objective. Our shared enemy today, more than ever before, is commodity content. Maybe you're familiar with the idea of the content or the marketing hamster wheel. Maybe your left eye just started to twitch. I wanna get off that thing, right? We try to do so much stuff, but we're not getting commensurate lift in results. Nothing we do works all that well. Everything we do is sort of generalized expertise that we're sharing publicly and it might be somewhat useful, but I can get it anywhere and, and I guess you're anywhere. And then one day, one clever little hamster pounding away on that hamster wheel has an idea. They're like, oh, I'm creating so much podcast content. I'm creating so much video content. Well, I can go to Fiverr and hire somebody to turn that and repurpose it into a blog post. And then all the other hamsters catch up. And now you have services saying they can turn an episode into 20 pieces of content. Or how about another service promising unlimited, unlimited repurposing power? Not unlimited communication power, not unlimited marketing power, just unlimited stuff. But what if we could get off of that hamster wheel? What if more of our work worked? What if we could stop competing on volume and learn how to compete on impact? Well, the impact of your content is directly proportional to two traits, its value and its originality. And you can plot how you're doing on a framework I call the idea impact matrix. There are two traits, value and originality. Let's plot them really quickly. The least valuable content you can create in support of your business is merely informational. The most valuable is insightful. So informational is like the six fastest growing brands today. Insightful, why are they growing so quickly? Informational, the backstory of Anthony Bourdain, my favorite storyteller. Insightful, what made Bourdain such an effective storyteller? Informational, what is AI? Insightful, why you should be thinking about using this AI tool in this capacity, in this niche for your business. Informational content is like handing people a map. It's North America. Here, you have that now. Somewhat useful, but not overly valuable. So more valuable is instructional. Those are the how-to pieces we tend to produce in our work today. That's like drawing a line on the map to an X. And you're like, here, go this way. Here's my directions. But the problem is when you send your audience away with that information or that instruction, a tree will fall inevitably on their path that you didn't anticipate in their specific situation. And now they don't know what to do. They're not overly empowered because they're a direction follower. An insight is much more like a compass. It's like empowering somebody to become a navigator. They can get their bearings. They know why something works, not just what works. And so they become unstoppable. It's the most valuable type of content they can use today. Think of it this way. Informational content updates people. Insightful content empowers them. To increase the value of your content, make it more insightful. Additionally, we can plot our progress on how original we are on a spectrum from general to personal. Could it come from anybody or could it only come from you and your perspective? And I'd ask everybody just a quick reminder to please mute if you haven't already. I'm getting some background noise right now. So a general piece of content is just that. I'm going to go and curate a bunch of things with no lens over that curation. And I'm going to talk about what one must do in this scenario. Everybody knows the importance of this technology today. Here are six tips for marketers to use it. That's generalized expertise. But personal would be to imbue that with some kind of personal story or anecdote. It's not six tips to produce a stronger podcast. It's you dissecting your five favorite shows en route to your prescription for producing a better podcast. It doesn't need to be vulnerable. It doesn't need to be something you're ashamed of sharing, but it does need to be from your personal perspective. I think of it this way. AI is trained on internet content. You are trained on the content of your life. No one else has access to that. That is the last remaining differentiator that we all possess. Your personal perspective is your biggest advantage, but are you using it? Now, most times we're not. We're trapped in the commodity cage and we're furiously pumping away on that hamster wheel. Nothing we produce produces the results we want. So we produce more and more and more stuff. And we're like, I'm gonna repurpose this thing into a million things. Was the original thing worth repurposing? That's besides the point because I'm on the hamster wheel and you're looking at 8,000 other hamsters crammed in there on their wheels. And you're like, I'm gonna beat you. I'm gonna repurpose so hard. I'm gonna go viral. Sir, you're on a hamster wheel. You're gonna go nowhere. 
<laughs> and then we try to get clever. Instead of fixing our problems, instead of recognizing that it's the very style of content that's causing our issues to begin with, we try to succeed in the place causing our problems. We're like, aha, I'm going to out opt and out think and out clever all of these other hamsters. So I'm going to post to, uh, to, to LinkedIn, right? Okay. What's the best time we can possibly post to LinkedIn for maximum engagement and reach? Well, this report from Shopify said 9 a.m. Great. So I'm going to post to LinkedIn at 9 a.m. But guess what happens tomorrow at 9 a.m. Now that that information is out there, that's no longer the best time to post. But I don't have time to make sense of that noise because I also have to care about all these other channels to promote my business like Facebook, but then Facebook rebrands as meta. What's meta? Oh, okay. It's not a new social network. It's just a collection of apps like Instagram. We're all over Instagram. Do y'all remember when Snapchat came along and started basically mimicking or more like Instagram was mimicking Snapchat and they were the same thing? Well, now that's kind of TikTok. It's the same thing here, the same thing there, the same thing everywhere. We're on Instagram, we're on TikTok. We also have a podcast, but the podcast can't just be audio. It's also got to be video. So we're going to post those videos, let's say on YouTube. Now we're going to create standalone videos on YouTube and now we're going to embed these videos on our website. But we also care about email because email marketing is incredibly powerful and defensible to own. You need an email list. But why are there some experts saying email marketing is dead? I disagree. That makes no sense, but I don't have time to vet their words because along comes all these trends. Like remember voice marketing. It's all about Amazon Alexa, no more visual logos. Or how about big data? That was a trend. Then it wasn't. Now it's back as a trend. Or how about product-led growth or experience-led growth or event-led growth or content-led growth or customer-led growth? Y'all, how many things have to lead growth? And now there's Web3 and NFTs and AI and ChatGPT and OMG, Alexa, please punch me in the face. <laughs> Is this our work? Really? Is this our fa I do not want to operate like this anymore. I can't be the only one who feels this way. I mean, it has never been easier to create mediocrity at scale. But most of us don't want to do that. We want to get off that hamster wheel. I titled the name of this talk. It's the urge to act. I could have called it something else. Free the hamsters. <laughs> Can we do that, people? Please. Well, opposite this commodity cage and this exhausting, ineffective style of marketing is something more powerful. I call it the field of favorites. There's not 8,000 other hamsters there. There's like 12 other people, right? Your work is more insightful. It's more personal. It's higher impact. It's actually working. And there, you're not like, exhausted all the time in doing your work. It's sunny, there's butterflies and rainbows, a unicorn trots by with a wagon full of refreshments served in golden cups. Is this marketing heaven? No, this is just what the job was supposed to be. We're running free in the field of favorites. And the best part is what happens when your audience discovers that you're creating your work from that place. They feel gratitude. They wander in off the internet and they're like grateful. They're like all haggard from what they experienced in a social feed somewhere. They're like, oh, thank God I found you. I was out on the internet looking for advice content and it was terrible. It was all the same. And then these podcasters started making video clips from their podcasts and they had gorgeous animated captions, but the video itself said like nothing of value at all. It's terrible. It's so beautiful here. Is that a unicorn? Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Imagine if that was the reaction we got from our audience. This isn't a dream. This is the work. This is possible. When you create commodities, you're forced to compete on volume. It's expensive. It's inefficient. It doesn't work. When you compete in the field of favorites, you get to compete on impact. You have higher impact ideas and content and more of your work works. So how do we do that? How do we make this change? I think it's really simple. We don't need more budget. We don't need permission from a stakeholder. We don't need to change our underlying goals. We need to start telling small stories with big meaning. That's it. It can start that simply. Let, let me show you what this looks like when it works. Let me show you the story of Michelle Warner, an entrepreneur and a business coach, and how she escaped the commodity cage. Michelle on her site says that she'll design you a tiny company that's built to last. She does business model design. And she teaches you how to build relationships that will power it so you don't have to rely quite as much on endless traffic to your website or endless followers on social. That's what she does. And early on, she really didn't stand out that easily. She did a lot of commodity content like this, how to be intentional with your business connections. I talk a lot about intentionally building relationships and connection and blah, blah, blah. Anybody could say this. She was trapped in the commodity cage. 
Well, when that's us, I think we all have the same reaction. We want more results from our content and we're not getting it. And so we immediately think, well, we got to reach more people, right? And this never made sense to me because you can reach some people now, 5,000 or five. And those people already know, like, and trust you. And the people who are giving you the benefit of the doubt, who know, like, and trust you already are signaling to you that your work isn't working. They're not responding. They're not buying. They're not sharing. And why do we think, huh, well, the people who trust me most don't like this stuff. I better put it in front of way more people. That makes no sense at all. We typically think we have reach problems when really we have a resonance problem. See, reach is how many see it, but resonance is how much they care. No amount of reach guarantees that they care. What you know is valuable. What you say has to make that clear. You have to ensure that they care. And if they don't, they won't act. And if they don't act, we don't see results. From resonance, not reach, comes results. So when you want more results from your content, don't think reach more. Think, I got to resonate deeper. And there are two things you can start doing right away to stand out easier from all the commodity cage noise and resonate deeper with your audience. Thing number one, develop a premise. Your premise is the specific defensible purpose for your work pulled from your perspective. It's like the big idea you want to become known for. A premise is kind of like an assertion you make from which everything else follows. So a couple examples here. If I assert, this is my premise. If I assert being creative doesn't mean doing anything big, it's the sum of lots of small hidden choices that make you creative. Well, then which is a better podcast for me to host? Either how stories happen, where storytellers break apart a signature story and piece by piece tell you how they made it, or story stars, long form biographies and advice interviews with legendary storytellers, which makes more sense for this particular assertion or premise. How stories happen, which by the way, is my new show coming out this spring, because I have an assertion I'm making about how to do this work. The work flows more easily and stands out a lot better. Or if I assert that to grow your business, you should prioritize deep resonance over broad reach, which is a better speech for me to give? The urge to act, how to differentiate by owning an influential idea to move the market, or follower frenzy, how to predictably go viral to win the attention economy. I am asserting that the first makes more sense because it's on premise for me. And I want to become known for an idea like resonance. Rishikesh Hirway is known for music production. What helps him become known is his premise of his podcast, Song Exploder. Music should be understood and appreciated in the minutia of making it. When you have a great premise, the word should comes out in how you describe yourself or your brand. Music should be like this. Jay Bear is known for customer experience. He has a book, some research, and a keynote about the time to win. You should prioritize speed of response as an advantage for your business, but you should also find the right speed for the right interaction because nobody's looking for Boston's fastest tattoo artist. Anne Handley is, writing, uh, is known for writing and marketing. Everybody writes her book and her speech. You should write to drive results and fill your soul. They are known for these ideas. They own these premises because they make an assertion of what should be. Then they go create their work to make it happen. This doesn't just apply to projects. It can also apply to whole platforms or brands. Dan Runcy is known for the business of hip hop. He runs the business called Trapital. It's a media company. And he talks about the change, what should be. I started Trapital to change the narrative. Artists and entertainers have become one of our, our most successful business leaders. Basically, they deserve a platform the way other industries have for those leaders. Hip hop artists deserve that too. He wants to elevate hip hop culture. The business of hip hop needs its own home and Trapital was launched in 2018 to do just that. So your premise, your assertion can support your entire organization or platform, not just a single project. They work in harmony, however, your projects and your platform. Here's a good example. Laura Eastburn is known for Facebook and Instagram ads. She's the list building expert. Get in line how many people say they are, but no one else says it's about speaking human to win the internet. She says she believes the act of marketing comes with culture making, social, linguistic, and human responsibilities, but quick fix, self fast marketing standards persist. She talks about understanding how words ap operate in the world, how they change the culture, and what they even mean matters. So her project, her newsletter, is called One Word. Every newsletter, she gives you a word that she thinks you should know about, talks about the origin and how to use it more effectively. Why? Because if you speak human, you win the internet. 
She's not just in a category. She stands alone. Remember, you can't own your audience. That's common advice. Own your audience. Get off social. Have a newsletter. Have a membership. You can't own your audience. But you can own an idea in their minds. And that's what we're after. Look, I believe that you are smart enough to differentiate from the commodities. You are expert enough. That's not the issue. The problem is that your IP isn't strong enough to ensure others care. Because it's not what you explore, but how you explore it, which gives others a reason why they'd care. In other words, your premise provides to others motivation to care. Maybe some of the people I just encountered or shared with you, or maybe someone else you're encountering, makes you feel that jolt to the chest, like, wow, this, it's so for me. Right away, they provide motivation to care. How can we do that too? Well, Michelle has learned to do that, and I think her story is rather revealing. She doesn't publish commodity stuff like this anymore. Here's an example of something she sent her newsletter uh, this summer, which worked better. Much better opening line, just to begin. Pop quiz. What's the first thing you should do when you're sitting on your couch late on a Saturday night, and out of nowhere, a bat flies overhead? Answer, not what I did. Well, what did you do? I Googled, obviously. She was freaking out and looking for strategies, and she goes on to explain that all of the Googled advice conflicted with each other. Sound familiar when we're agonizing over a problem and want immediate answers? It's all conflicting. Should she do this or that? I don't know. I'm stressed. So she went to her friends to sleep that night and the bat flew out of an open window. The next day, she says, when she could think clearly, she realized she'd fallen into her own trap, the trap she helps her entrepreneur clients avoid in their businesses. She chased strategy, demanding immediate results instead of prioritizing sequence. She says, I worried more about what to do instead of focusing on what order to do things, which is always the wrong choice. You want to think sequence over strategy, not strategy over sequence, sequence first, always. A powerful, high impact idea. It's insightful and it's personal. It's not commodified thinking. And I asked her how this performed for your business. And without hesitating, she told me my best performing email in months. So what is the premise? What is the one thing she is asserting here that helps her stand out easier and resonate deeper? Did you spot it? Sequence over strategy. What she knows stayed the same, but what she said made her words carry more power. It's not a volume game, it's a power game. Same constraints as the low impact stuff allowed her to have a greater impact even still. She didn't have to win new budget or spend more time on this stuff. It was a weekly newsletter, 500 words of practical advice meant to connect with prospects. But that email was the best performing email in months. To that point in her year, it was a lift of over 600% over the average replies that she used to get. Over 150% lift in qualified leads willing to get on a phone call with her. And all of these people responding were responding with passion and gratitude. Thank you for doing what you do. I needed this. This woman in the front says thank you five times in six sentences. She even uses the word resonant to describe Michelle. That's the power of a premise. Now, a caveat here. A premise is not a niche. A niche defines your market, but a premise is used to influence your market. It's how you navigate, operate, and move that market towards you more quickly towards whatever the action is that you're pointing them towards. A subscription, a sale, a referral. A niche can be picked in theory. You can decide you're for these types of people, but a premise must be developed actively. You have to move from rough but relevant ideas in your head to something pithy and powerful that you own publicly. That is a process of active idea development. Michelle has gone through that process. I helped her through it to own sequence over strategy. After weeks of work together, of her being honest with me, I call it the two drink minimum version of you. Have a couple drinks, let it rip, rant, be honest. Tell me how you really feel about what's happening in your industry and what the customer is not seeing but should. Then, after weeks of that frustration and publishing all this ranty content online to see if it's stuck, we arrive at something called the empathy statement. This is something I stole from Hollywood. When you develop shows, you have an empathy statement. It's meant to answer a simple question. Why are you for me? Or why is this project for me? And it has four parts that you can actively write to kind of create the starter dough copy that you can always dip into or quote directly whenever you're asked to pitch yourself and why people should care on a podcast that you're interviewed on, the intro to your own podcast, when you write articles, when you post on social, when you have a conversation, it can all flow out of that empathy statement in such a powerful way. There are four pieces to the empathy statement. First, align with your audience. You are this, and you want 
this goal. Then agitate the frustration that's in the way. And then what list of symptoms let them know that this matters? I'll get to an example in a second. But you raise the stakes because even though you want that goal, there's something in the way and it's super, super powerful, right? My hamster wheel chaos rant of all the tactics arriving at Alexa punch me in the face. That's what I was doing there. Then you assert. What is the assertion you have? What is the change you're proposing that people make? Your vision for what would be better. And finally, you invite. Where is this all leading? Where are you taking us as a visionary thinker in your space that's worth following? Can you provide me motivation to subscribe? Which means not just click a button, but subscribe to your belief system. Subscribe to the way you see the world and build your business. So here's Michelle's in brief. You're an online entrepreneur providing high-end services. You're great at the thing others hire you to do, but nobody taught you to build a business, let alone do it your way. So you read some blogs, you bought some books, you followed some experts, you took some courses. And that helped for a time, but things never felt smooth or sustainable. You gained traction, but the work didn't get easier. In fact, maybe you're feeling burnt out. So we're aligned. Now I'm going to agitate that. This is urgent. This matters. Maybe there's no hope, but I'm here to provide some. Worse, maybe you blamed yourself for how you felt. The thing is, all those things you learned and tried never really formed a coherent business model. When you throw spaghetti at the wall, you introduce too many variables, so you can't figure out which to repeat and which to change or kill. When things aren't repeatable, they aren't sustainable. By braiding together a bunch of strategies, you didn't create a sturdy business model. So what can we do instead? Well, there's a million things you could do. Michelle, Michelle asserts that this is the most important. She has a vision for you. That's what visionaries are, not these fake gurus on social. A visionary has a vision. They see clearly what should be. They make an assertion. They have a premise. It's time to stop reacting to the latest trends or the biggest experts, stop throwing spaghetti against the wall, and stop seeking the right answer. Instead, you can become the type of entrepreneur who raises your hand to say, I don't have the answers, but I'm going to figure this out and do it anyway. Ask yourself, what's the next right action to take so that over time, you develop the right business for yourself? Knowing the next right move to make matters more than knowing all the moves. You don't need a strategy. You need a sequence. Oh my gosh, I'm so close to running with her. You? And then you invite them. Michelle goes, I'm Michelle Warner and I design sturdy business models built to last and teach entrepreneurs how to build the relationships to power them. Subscribe to my work as together we rethink how to build a business based on a simple question. What's the best thing to do next? No pristine playbooks or savior strategies here. Figuring out what you need to do today is more vital to your success as an entrepreneur than adopting anyone's theoretical blueprint. Stop gathering up the answers you think you need to act. Act. Find your answers. Think sequence over strategy. There is such power in this idea, and it's defensible. It's the specific defensible purpose. She can own it outright in the market, and it's pulled from her personal perspective. And the means of ownership now comes through the content all her guest appearances on other podcasts. She talks about this. She's even launching a show, which I helped her develop called Sequence Over Strategy. That's coming soon. On her newsletter, when you subscribe, you get a welcome note. She talks about that premise. Over 50% of the last year's worth of her newsletter sends have used the phrase overtly. And I'd argue the other 50% were just about the phrase, but didn't say it. Michelle is a business coach for entrepreneurs. I mean, get in line, how many are there? But unlike other business coaches for entrepreneurs, only Michelle redesigns your business model using the principle of sequence over strategy. Some of what she is, is commodified. But how she sees it is not. She has a premise. What you do is commodified. Let's call that variable X. How you see it, however, is defensible. It's not commodified. That's how you break free and stand out easier and resonate deeper. Let's call that variable Y. Now we can use this very simple two variable set to develop our premises actively. Let's get into that now. I call it the XY premise pitch. This is a thing, whatever project or platform or service or product it is, maybe it's just a person. This is a thing about X, the topic, the category. Unlike other things about X, only we or only I, Y. So the X is that topic. It's the thing that is commodified. You're going to be part of a genre or a competitive set or a category. Even if you disagree that you are there, customers will put you there in their minds implicitly. We're better off embracing it. Hey, you know that you're searching for a business coach for entrepreneurs? Yeah, Michelle's one of those. But unlike the rest, she does this. That's called the hook or the angle or the conceit. 
And there are seven categories of hooks that we can look at to better develop our ideas from rough and relevant to those pithy, powerful concepts, AKA the premise. Let's go through these seven types of hooks. But first, I really need to clarify something because this word, I've been using it for years, has gotten away from most of us on social media in particular. This is not what I mean by a hook. Maybe you've encountered social content like this. Not what I mean. ChatGPT is 100 trillion users and they got them all in seven seconds, which makes them faster than every other business. Look, here's all their logos and their speed to market, but almost no one is using it correctly. That's not a hook. That's the worst. <laughs> this says nothing about what this individual believes. This says nothing about what they stand for. It's a ploy. It's a cheap trick. It's a stunt. Anybody could say this. It's yet more commodified stuff. This is a hamster furiously pumping on the hamster wheel, saying nothing of value that much, nothing that insightful, nothing that personal, and trying to lace it with something sensational because they have to over promote and over hustle because what they say has very little power. That's what we see from most people publishing hooks. A hook, according to author and speaker Andrew Davis, is a refreshing twist on a familiar theme designed to grip your audience. And you apply that twist not because you know it grabs attention, but because that twist is how you see it. It's business coach or business advice or entrepreneurial advice from Michelle, but the twist is she's through seeing it through a lens, her premise, her assertion, sequence over strategy. So here are the different categories with some examples. Let's start thinking about our businesses, shall we? <clears throat> the first is the gimmick. It's a recurring conceit or mechanic that alters the experience. Let's use some examples. I'll use the XY premise pitches. This is a celebrity interview YouTube show. Unlike other celebrity interview YouTube shows, and my gosh, how many are there? Only Hot Ones has its guests eat progressively hotter wings as they answer progressively tougher questions. This is a podcast about living an awesome life. Again, tons of them exist, but unlike all of them, only three books asks its guests to explain the three books that most transform them. So you've heard an interview with Shaq. You've heard an interview with Sidney Sweeney, but not like you've heard them on Hot Ones. You've heard an interview with Seth Godin. You've heard an interview with Brene Brown, but not like you've heard them on three books. Because by using a gimmick, they create unique experiences with common guests or topics. This is the easiest of all the hooks to apply to your work. And it can also go off the rails. I saw a marketing tech company once rip off hot ones. So they interviewed CMOs. They have the same basic BS questions that those CMOs get everywhere, commodity content, but they asked the CMOs to eat progressively hotter wings. That's a missed opportunity. It said nothing about that SaaS brand. Unless that SaaS company wanted to be known as the company that helps marketers face increasing pressures. So on our show, we increase pressure on our guests. Now the hook is of service to the premise, to the thing you wanna own. What is the idea you wanna own outright in the market? It's not just a stunt to get attention. It says something that matters about you to other people. So they remember you, so they buy from you, so they share from you, share you. All right, the second, we're gonna go from easiest to hardest to execute. The second is the pattern break, discussing familiar topics in unfamiliar environments. So this is a show about comedy, unlike others about comedy, only comedians in cars getting coffee. It's right there in the name. This is a celebrity interview show. Unlike others, including unlike hot ones, only actors on actors removes the journalist to feature two actors interviewing each other instead. By using a pattern break, in other words, getting out of the routine and the expected, it changes people's demeanor, increasing the odds that you get a refreshing experience of them and their ideas. The next is the day part. This is the one that I'm a little bit cautious around and I'll explain why in a second. This is when you seek to own a specific part of someone's day or routine. The day part, this is a video series about SEO. Unlike others about SEO, only Whiteboard Fridays helps you ease into the weekend with a friendly, upbeat look at SEO tactics and trends explained via Whiteboard. This is a news podcast. Unlike other news podcasts, only Up First gives you the three biggest stories in 10 minutes or less that you need to start your day, released at 6 a.m. daily. By using a day part, they become part of their audience's regular routine. But the problem here is we're in an on-demand world now. You're not like tuning in on a Tuesday on cable to watch your favorite show because that's when it's on. We can get whatever we want whenever we want it. And so I can watch Whiteboard Friday on Wednesday. So it's really difficult to just say it's for that moment and not go to an extreme to ensure the day part matters. And an extreme would be to do it daily. Across a whole platform, you have Ryan Holiday's The Daily Stoic. Across a project, The Daily from the New York Times. So the day part can be effective, but our current era on the internet has kind of rendered this one more difficult to pull off than maybe it's worth. But then you have the mashup, combining multiple disconnected elements to create an original. 
The mashup is one of my favorites because it's so visceral. It's so easy to understand how it, it's unique and you want in. This is a podcast about musicians. Unlike other podcasts about musicians, only Disgraceland combines true crime drama with behind the scenes stories from legendary artists and groups. It's like lore, true crime, meets behind the music on VH1. Behind the scenes stories from artists, right? I think the tagline for Disgraceland is your favorite musicians and artists getting away with murder and behaving very badly. Right? It's a great mashup. This is a limited run series I did for a client called Podia. They hired me to develop and host this show. It's a podcast about the creator economy, but unlike other podcasts about the creator economy, only I made it combines the dissection of a single project with advice for being a professional creator. So it's kind of like song exploder meets creator science from my friend, Jay Klaus. By using a mashup, they help the audience enjoy and learn whatever you're trying to teach from a new vantage point, helping separate from the familiar noise. All right, three more. Using a repeatable image or cue to make the complex idea simple, we have the visual hook. So this is a market research newsletter. I would argue they're now a market research company. Unlike other market research newsletters or companies, only Glimpse helps you spot trends before they're trending. And that premise comes through right in how they brand themselves. I mean, they focus on that moment of inflection, not what it's going to peak at, but how do you spot trends as they're about to go up? That's a great visual hook. Everywhere they go, you see a visual that represents that in their newsletter, in their content, on their website. This is more implied. It's a visual planted in your head because it's audio. This is a show about music. Unlike other shows about music, only Song Exploder asks musicians to take apart their songs and piece by piece tell the story of how it was made. Now, I have to add another one here because there's a, a very important condition to know about the visual hook or really about any hook that you use to separate. This is a show about comedy. Unlike other shows about comedy, only Working It Out has comedians work out new material. Now, in Working It Out's case, it's a segment. It's like 15 to 20% of their runtime is doing that, but they lift it out of the format and they make it the whole premise. Song Exploder, it's 100% of the format. That's all they do. So we don't necessarily have to do only the thing that's in the pitch of what we do, but that's the hook. That's the thing people are after. That's what provides motivation to care. Once they're in, they discover oh, it's kind of nice to hear the backstory of this guest before they work out material. Thank you, Mike Brabiglia, on working it out. But you're not advertising it as such. So by using a visual hook, they make ideas more accessible, memorable, and visceral. How are we doing, Jeff? Things good? We doing well? Okay, good, good. I love that. All right, two more. Now we're starting to tip towards the realm of larger platforms and a lot more of your perspective or vision. So you notice a lot of these so far are projects like newsletters and shows. As you get a little harder to execute, it gets a little broader or more all encompassing. So you can see these becoming a whole brand or a creative platform, a resource hub or a series of resources. That's what these later hooks can help you support. The challenge, second to last, answering key questions. <clears throat> by testing theories and constraints. So a couple of examples to clarify what that means. This is a video series about comic book heroes. Unlike video series about comic book heroes, only Power Levels treats film and TV footage like real evidence and talks to real physicists who decide who's more powerful, you know, Hulk or Thor. This is a podcast about tech trends. Unlike other shows about tech trends, only Hackable, I mean, it's in the name, Hackable? It's not Hackable, it's Hackable? They ask real hackers to teach us just how safe and secure a given technology really is. They have this gauntlet they throw. We're going to put this to the test. You got Mythbusters, you got Power Levels, you got Hackable. These can become entire platforms, right? Because you're going to, you can have a, a tool analysis feed of content where every day we're reviewing a different app. You have all these extensions you can create when your job is to basically put things to the test like they do. So by using a challenge, they set and raise the stakes, creating a very exciting and very irresistible experience that you can't wait to join because you can't wait to see what happens. Now, here's a conundrum. Which one is this show? This is a podcast about entrepreneurship. Unlike other shows about entrepreneurship, only founders host, reads one biography per week, and shares what he learns. Is that a challenge? Yeah. Can he read one a week? Is that a gimmick, the conceit that changes the experience? Also, yeah. So these are important, but they're more like guardrails. There's no hard and fast rules for what you can or must do. It's a prompting device. That's how I'd view this. And the last, my favorite, 
is the quest, inspiring others to go on a journey with you in support of a cause or to pursue a change. These un unquestionably support entire platforms and brands. So I mentioned Trapital from Dan Runcy. This is a media platform about hip hop. Unlike other platforms about hip hop, only Trapital breaks down the business side of the industry's most successful artists and entertainers. And again, he says that in his description. He, he asserts like, this is broken. I see the status quo and it ain't good enough. I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. I'll raise my hand and lead this industry in a better direction. We are all in the business of doing some version of that. We're all kind of launching quests. Heroic Public Speaking is a keynote speaker training organization. Unlike others who train speakers, only Heroic believes that the most effective, sustainable way to make the most of your speaking opportunities is to stop speaking and start performing. They say that a lot. Stop speaking, start performing. Their competitors don't say that. Here's one organization. You bring the message, the content and the performance. You do it. We don't want to do it. You do it. We help you get booked and paid. Or how about this one? It's about speed. Make a bigger impact, but faster. Get there faster. Or this third one's pretty generic. Everything you need to become an exceptional virtual presenter and public speaker. Everything. Heroic public speaking is focused. It's specific. And it's defensible. They have a unique assertion and a point of view on how to execute it. We believe that a speech has the power to change the world, the people in it, and the speaker. And there's one side of it, which is just winging it. Yeah, you bring the message. Whatever you say, it's fine. That doesn't work. What works is deliver a transformational speech by mastering the craft that goes into performance. Discover what the best performers in the world know about delivering world-class performances because you don't get keynotes. You earn them. We can't get you keynotes. We can't get you booked and paid. Our competitors claim that you don't get keynotes. You earn them. Can you perform? Can you deliver? All of these and others that I've shared with you before, they are inspiring others on a journey. So by using a quest, they create whole brand identities, personal or corporate, built around the audience going on some kind of journey they didn't expect. They ask bold questions. They assert, we're going to that mountain peak, not the others. Come with me, join me, subscribe. And therefore that's going to make your life better as a member. So all of these are slightly different, but they all share similar traits. They answer the question, why is this for me? Oh, because we, we make this simple. Your competitors would claim they do too. Uh, we help you uh, send uh, more emails to sell more of your crap to people. Yeah, you know, All your competitors do that too. Why is this for me, really? What's the hook? They go beyond a niche. They're not just in a category. They're not just targeting an audience. They're influencing that audience. They're also easily articulated in plain language, jargon-free. I know everybody today is hot to create a category. I don't think you need to. And I think it's actually a lot harder and a lot less likely that you do because that's not what's needed to influence the market. People are heading in a direction. You're helping them get there faster or see what they don't see to get there today. You also use your premise to create IP extensions. This is also from Hollywood. So the IP is the idea you develop. You extend it into something that brings it to market, like a show, a book, a speech, a course, etc. And then you can extend it, exploring it in different mediums, newsletter, book, speech, different spin-out projects. Hey, we have to explore it from this angle or for this type of person until you own the idea publicly in their minds. And because you own that idea, you spark word of mouth growth, which I think is the holy grail for all growth. Other people promoting you for free. You resonate deeper with them and your premise gives them shared language to describe you to others. I am very fortunate that I've been riding this train for a while. Resonance, that's the word. If you read me, if you watch me, if you listen to me, that's the word. And the phrase that supports it, the change I'm proposing, the assertion I'm making is you should stop trying to be the best and learn to be their favorite. Don't be the best, be their favorite. And I'm fortunate to sit in front of you today and have people out there like armies of my advocates saying it on my behalf. And they'll quote me or they'll tell me what piece of what I'm saying resonated with them. Or they'll say, hey, you know, you don't know this guy, but it sounds like this person I follow named Jay. Here's what he says. I'm not doing this promotion. They're doing it for me because of the premise that I have. It's kind of like I'm Italian, right? So it's kind of like um, in The Godfather, uh, you know, in the baptism scene where he's like, sitting there just very stoic and he's like trying to be a good godfather but his hench people are doing all the murdering for him it's like that but less murdery that's that's what we want i think a emphasis on the less murdery so thing number one to develop your premise is create an assertion what should this be like what do they get wrong go on a journey that people didn't expect to join because you're pointing them to a mountain mountain peak because that's your perspective and once you have that perspective, once you have that premise, you can tell stories from your life pressed through the premise. And this is key. I want you to be a storyteller. 
but this is not what I want you to be. Kudos if you are. This is not what I mean by be a storyteller. Do something innovative, groundbreaking, and newsworthy. This is not what I want you to be. Again, kudos if you are an amazing artist, top of your field in whatever medium you've chosen. Remember, we're telling small stories with big meaning because AI and people both rely on LLMs as their foundations. AI has large language models. People have little life moments. Why was Michelle's story so effective? Because she pulled from her little life moments and she imbued it with more meaning because she knows her premise. It was much more powerful. And she used a very simple story structure to do so. It has three parts and we can use it today. The first, this happened. It's a personal memory or moment, something we can't shake, something we've observed. Then, which made me realize it's an idea that's sparked by that. And finally, that's the thing about the top, excuse me, the topic that you're here to teach, the insight that they need from you. Here's an example. Imagine I wanted to encourage you to try new things. That was my whole premise. I want to help people try new things. And I'm here before you today to tell you that, uh, you know, you should just stop agonizing over the research part and, and just do it because uh, studies show that people fear the unknown and not the task itself. It's a commodified way of saying it. It's not very high impact. But imagine I said, so I'm Italian. And if you can't tell by the most of me, I assure you, yeah, I'm Italian, hair, hands, all of it. It's true. And for years, I was afraid to make espresso. I have a gorgeous machine in my kitchen, but I'd ask my wife to do it, or I'd research how to do it, or follow espresso influencers. I wouldn't do it. Be embarrassing, really. But today, I make it every day. And all that changed was I made it one time. This happened. And that made me realize, oh, wow, I wasted a lot of time being afraid, researching, seeking advice, asking my wife, because it turns out I wasn't afraid of the task itself. Once I did it, it was kind of easy. And even if I messed up, my research became much more focused and efficient. No, it wasn't the task. It was the unknown that I was afraid of. Well, that's the thing about trying new things. If what we fear is the unknown, not the task, we ought to move faster to make the unknown known. Before you agonize, before you outsource, before you over-research, just try it once. I hope you agree that while that was a nothing story, nothing groundbreaking or newsworthy, it's a higher impact way to communicate the same point. Because what I knew stayed the same, but what I said changed to resonate deeper. That's what Michelle did. This happened. A bat flew overhead. The advice on Google mixed. She went to her friends. The bat exited. The next morning she realized and she says the word realized. And that's the thing about designing your business model. Always think sequence over strategy. Remember, there's a difference between being a good storyteller and an effective storyteller. A teller. A good storyteller can grip you, but an effective storyteller moves you. They move you to some kind of insight pulled from your premise. Remember to arrive at your that's the thing about moments. What is your insight pulled from your personal perspective? Look, we're all experiencing the pain of being trapped in this hamster wheel scenario in our marketing. And when that's the case, we look for process to save us, some kind of checklist or blueprint. The things I'm offering today and the things that help us escape that commodity cage are all about your posture. There is not a simple process. Even the things I shared as frameworks today may or may not work for you. It's about how you see yourself and the world and the confidence to draw upon your life, your LLM, your little lived moments to extract insights from your own personal experience. That is why you'd stand out and resonate. So to create commodity content, go ahead, trust your checklist and stay there doing this work that doesn't quite work. But to create something more original, we have to learn how to trust ourselves. If we want to stand out easier and resonate deeper, we have to start by developing a premise, that, de that defensible idea we own. What do you want to be known for and synonymous with in this world? Then we use that as a lens. We press all the stories from our personal lives through that premise, arriving at the powerful, that's the thing about moments. Ultimately, to do this is not to trust any kind of strategy or blueprint, but to trust yourself. I believe you're smart enough, but maybe your IP isn't strong enough to differentiate and to resonate. And maybe that's the problem because insights and personal stories don't come from any years of experience or hack or cheat or tool. It just comes from you. That's the thing about making what matters to your career, company, or community. When you matter more, you can hustle for attention less. What's the best Disney film of all time? I don't know. I don't think we can say in any objective sense. And the thing is, that's not what matters. Don't market more, matter more. Don't be the best, be their favorite.
Thank you so much. And I so appreciate Jeff and Outsetter for giving me this time with you all today. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I just want to leave um, the group with a couple comments of my own, and then we can open it up uh, if people do have questions. Um, but the two points I wanted to make is I've fallen into a trap that I think is very common of startup founders in the sense that I even look at my own business through the lens of it is a commodity. Like those of you who are familiar with Outsetta, we sell CRM, we sell email marketing, we sell billing. And the reason I ultimately hired Jay is because I'm sort of looking at the business and what we offer way through much, way too much through the lens of this is a commoditized thing and not bringing my little lived moments, um, you know, sort of to our storytelling um, and, and not bringing enough of my own perspective. So that's what he's actually helping, helping me with. And beyond that, I just want to say like the reason Jay is on this call, the reason I hired Jay is because his ideas resonate with me. So everything that he just kind of talked about, um, it, it works and I'm evidence of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend. We're, we're in inning one. I'm really excited about where outside is going. All right, let's uh, open it up. If people have questions, comments, things they want to ask of Jay. Or, or feel free to contact me privately too. I'm happy to answer things once you get a chance to sort of distill everything today. That's fine too. But I appreciate all the kind words in the chat. You're all muted too. So you do have to unmute yourselves if you want to say something. <laughs> <clears throat> Archie's asking what you learned from me and implemented in Outsetta. Still very much, um, still very much a work in progress. Um, I think Jay is dealing with my baggage right now, I would say, uh, and helping me sort of sift, sift through it. Um, yep. I mentioned I think, the two drink minimum. I want the honesty from Jeff about how he views this world and this work. We're still there, but for Jeff, it's like, I need to give him three or four more shots than the average bear. Uh, yes, we're, we're cutting past a lot of uh, <laughs> conventional stuff still. We're, we're on call number two. Yeah, I, I would say just to speak to sort of my experience, um, going deeper on what I said earlier, um, I've <laughs> fallen into a trap of just looking at what we offer as sort of necessary technical infrastructure to run a business. And it certainly is that a billing system, a CRM, an email tool, it is that. But we do view the world differently. I do view the world differently in terms of what you need out of your technology and how we support our customers and those sorts of things. Um, and I sort of default to an uninspiring view of what we offer sometimes. Uh, and Jay is kind of helping me get out of that um, cage that I've put myself in a bit. It's very clear to me that there's a bunch of stuff that Jeff believes that he's couching because he's thinking about marketing positioning and it's my job to, to break past that. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. All right, we got Tim, Tim S. Hey, um, I just wanted to say, Jeff, I've been following out Seta for a while. And the the end of year letter that you sent out um, that sort of like had, you know, all of your business, you know, dealings with 2023 and where you were and where you were going from there is like what really resonated with me. And I think that a lot of your customer base on Outseta is like other entrepreneurs, right? We're all starting, you know, our websites, our businesses, our dreams, and seeing where you were with yours, like really like drove a lot of value. And I was like, whoa, I can't believe that he's sharing all of this information. And it was like the one email that I keep coming back to. And I'm just like, oh, that was a really resonant moment for me in Outseta. Awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I, I think when it comes to our business, um, <clears throat> I have done a decent job of being vulnerable about my experience as a founder. And I think that that has resonated with a lot of people. The bridge that I'm trying to, to sort of cross is how do we take all these experiences and all these perspectives that I do have and also apply it to the product that we're selling in a way that matters to customers. Um, I, I feel like I've gotten a lot of feedback similar to what you just said. That's like you share so openly. That's great. It resonates with me. But then I talk about our, our product in a very sort of dry, commoditized way. 
and there's some sort of fusion between those two things that needs to occur. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're working on. Well, you're my favorite, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There it is. All right. We got, uh, Sammy, Sammy James. I want to second that. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Sammy. I've been trying to figure out how to do business with Jeff since I, I discovered his, uh, website because it does resonate with me already. So I can't imagine the leap you're going to take from where you are now, which already to me is differentiated way beyond, uh, any other SaaS uh, site or story or whatever, you, you know, that one would gather from a, just the exposure of the website, which is pretty much my <clears> only <throat> exposure, maybe some newsletters. So I, I think, you know, you're already there as far as I'm concerned. And I've been, I mean, it's, it's so strong that I'm going, how can I do business with this guy? And I'm, I, and I, you know, obviously I like the concept uh, of having all of these, you know, multiple services under one umbrella, which is fantastic, but just your approach has been great. So what you're uh, going to do next, I, I, you know, it's going to be amazing. So don't don't discount what you already already do. So I would just say that. My question though is um, for uh, Jay is how do you kind of take your life little moment that kind of got you, you know, kind of I guess uh, whatever that is that you would call. I don't know what you refer to it. Life's little moments. I don't know what it. But how do you deconstruct that or, or take that and then what what's the exercise you use to sort of help get through that um, yep. process. When you when you develop a premise, you're very much thinking like an author, right? An author is an explorer, not an expert, even though they have expertise. You're like, this is weird in the world or not understood or broken. I'm going to go on, on a journey personally. A lot of authors do it behind the scenes. Increasingly, you see it publicly in their content before the book comes out. That's premise development. Think like an author. When it comes to story development, think like a comedian. Comedians are constantly aerating and validating their ideas. I mean, the name of Seinfeld's book is, is this anything? Not I'm a genius comedian, right? It's you need to, and this is the difficult part. I can get clients like Jeff, membership, members of my membership. I can get them to the point where they're like, okay, in the document we're using, that language looks pretty good. Like the language I showed you, Michelle's empathy statement. But that was also draft four or five with her because, um, a lot of the head trash in the way or just being close to it prevents us from seeing how to articulate an idea that others need to see. Like I know as a speaker, I got to meet people where they're at when I step on stage. I can't just be like, hi, I'm here. Stop doing the thing you're doing. Do the thing I want you to do. That's a terrible speech. I have to meet you where you're at and march you every step of the way to where I think you should go. Otherwise, you're going to bail, um, even if it's just mentally, not physically from your seat. Comedians understand this. Comedians understand that. I have an idea that sounds good in theory, maybe even to trusted peers. This is why build in public among tech entrepreneurs is dangerous because unless you sell to those tech entrepreneurs, they're going to start sending you muddied data for what they love and what they don't love. Um, I want to go to LinkedIn. Every time you see me show up on LinkedIn or 95% of the time, I'm like, is this anything? Did I say it right? What do you think? And I'm looking for feedback so I can then take that little mini proof concept and do something higher stakes with it. Take that little mini anecdote that I've proven or vetted or not, and then maybe put it into an essay, which is higher stakes for me and higher cost, right? It takes more time to write the essay and then work my way towards, okay, now it's a whole how stories happen. The premise of that show was built over like 18 months of my newsletter, trying to figure this stuff out. Like, How do I help people become storytellers when it's much more than just a checklist or a story structure that they need? What do they need? I don't know. I got to talk my way there. I got to write my way there. So when you feel like you have a story thread, you're like walking your dog and you're like, huh, that's a thing. And that made me realize something about my work. You can write it out and put it in a notebook or you can immediately put it in front of an audience. And so that's how I try to act all the time is I want to collect six to 10 signature stories where I'm like, these are the models that go in my speeches, my books with clients on the website. They come through in content. They come through in guest interviews I do, you know, and to, to get to those signature stories, just like a comedian signature bits, just like a speaker signature bits, I'm going to have to tell those stories all over the place all the time, but I can de-risk it by using like social networks less as a promotional tool and more as an idea vetting and validation tool. And that's, <clears throat> that's something we're working on right now. If you go to outsetacom slash blog, the most recent blog post I published earlier this week is sort of me hashing out one of those ideas. And it's an article that was written literally just to put out on social media and sort of 
see if it resonated with people, see how people react to it. Um, so that's an example of us yes. sort of going through this process together. And by the way, I didn't say this because we we're short on time, Jeff, but the title of it alone, obsessing in the right directions, like all, everyone you serve has an obsession. They, they have a craft they love, like teaching storytelling, teaching premise development, and necessarily want to turn that into a business. Or they love the tech elements and the stitching together and the motions of building a SaaS or building a membership that leads them to you, or at least your category. They put that, that stuff puts them in the market for you, whether or not they know you exist is next. And what we discovered is so often there are the right customers for you are obsessing in the right direction about stuff. And then there are the wrong customers that optically could buy from you because they're building a membership business of some kind, a subscription business of kind, but they're obsessing in the wrong direction, right? So is yeah. this it? We don't know. We got to try it on for size, right? Like that's all we're doing here is we're going to aerate and validate, go through a period of pressure testing the idea, revisit the internal documentation, update it, then say with certainty or at least more certainty, yeah, this can support the whole business or the homepage gets updated or it's the next big pillar project like a podcast we're launching or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. That's down the road. We get yep. so over our skis to produce content or copy without actually validating whether or not that idea was powerful enough to move the market. Yep. <clears throat> and by the way, comedians, authors, public speakers, like anyone in that kind of world we should study those people because that's what they do. They don't think in content, they think in IP. They don't think I gotta like promote this work to other people like I'm an expert. They think I gotta validate this stuff quickly to other people because eventually I want not this tiny little audience on the side stage, I want the Netflix special. Eventually I don't want subscribers, I want sales, right? So like we're always trying to up level what the power of our words can do for us, but we're trying to leap from theory out into the world. And then we're wondering why isn't it working? Why isn't it resonating? Well, it's because you haven't aerated your thinking at all. You haven't pressure tested it. Makes sense. <clears throat> Anybody else? Final final call for questions here. All right. We'll cool. let everybody get back to it then. Jay, thank you again so much. It was a pleasure you, having you. I think everybody got a lot out of this and uh, looking forward to more. Thanks, everybody. Keep making what matters. See ya. Bye. <clears throat>